Thanks for joining us in another episode of Blue and Gold, where our goal is to promote student voices and better engage the public through discussions of our common history. Today, we're featuring a student-produced podcast from one of our history courses taught here at the U.S. Naval Academy. It represents a winning combination of diligent research and thoughtful presentation. We hope you appreciate our students' efforts as much as we do. For more information about this episode, the midshipmen involved, and the class for which it was produced, please see the episode's description. Welcome back to the Squadcast podcast. I'm your host, Aiden Michelson, and today we'll be discussing technologies in World War I. With me, we have... Allison. Rose. Patrick. And right now we're going to discuss a little bit about the nation we researched and just kind of an introduction into World War I. So I researched Great Britain, and they entered World War I in August 1914 after the expiration of Ultimatum to Germany because their official explanation was that they wanted to protect Belgium as a neutral country, but realistically they didn't want France to be defeated because then Germany would have been in control of all of Western Europe. One of the main things that I focused on was innovations in British artillery and their changes in war doctrine and strategy due to those innovations. I researched mainly Russia and a bit of the USA. Russia entered early in the war, 1914, supporting Serbia with its alliance. They, uh, they had a severe lack of weapons innovation, so I really focused on uh, some strategy and tactics they brought to the table and how that shaped strategy and tactics uh, in later wars on the line. And then on the U.S. side, they joined super late in the war in 1917, and I mainly talked about the shotgun, the mechanics behind that, and how much Germany hated that. Uh, And I researched France, who joined August 1914 after Germany declared war on France, so obviously they also declared war on Germany. Uh, And I mostly researched trench warfare because that was kind of the main gist of fighting, was via trench warfare. But I also dipped into some of Germany's advancements and innovations and how that affected France, who were just very reactive in their weapon development. So I did the German Empire, and the German Empire was an absolute war machine at the brink of World War I. Germany entered the war after Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, and all the Allies did not agree with that, so they kind of declared war on Austria-Hungary. At the start of the war, Germany had 700,000 men conscripted, but by the first battle in France, they had mobilized 3.8 million people, and in total, they mobilized 11 million people. Some of the topics that I discussed with Germany was their use of chemical weapons to break the stalemates of trench warfare, how they completely dominated the new domain of the sky with their airplanes, and their revolutionary specialization in infantry tactics with the creation of the stormtroopers. So when I think of World War I, the biggest thing that I really think of is trench warfare. And I know you cover trench warfare, Rose, so would you like to bring that to the table? Oh, yeah. So Germany, they uh, implemented the Schleifen Plan, which was just a military tactic and plan to just kind of surround France on, like, two sides, sort of, in order to just envelop them in German war. (laughs) And so they could just annihilate them really quickly. This happened after Germany invaded and went through Belgium. So all the German troops were in France. So all the war and fighting took place um, on the French side. And so with a bunch of innovation into light machine gun fire, that obviously can kill people really easily because it goes really, really fast, all the bullets. So the French and all the tactic they implemented was trench warfare, digging channels into the ground and just burrowing in there as they continued to fire machine guns and, and rail guns across the sarin plane between each of the sides. I don't know if you want to talk more about the German side, but that's kind of like the background of trench warfare. I know with the Schlieffen plan, Germany had the idea that they were going to just march through these nations extremely quick and they didn't really have the mechanized capacity to really do that. And the problem with that is that allowed the French time to really dig in and set up their defenses. And so one of the things that the Germans developed to kind of break that stalemate, because at the time, trench warfare was really two trenches, heavily entrenched, and we're going to just send a wave of people, and they're going to get gunned down, and hopefully a few of them make it and are able to push the lines. And German high command kind of realized, like, hey, that's not really effective. You know, we're losing a lot of people. They're losing a lot of people. There's got to be a better way about doing it. 
So besides artillery, one of the biggest things the Germans implemented was chemical warfare. They first used chlorine gas at the Battle of Ypres in uh, Belgium. They just poured over these cans of chlorine gas and let the wind push it into the British and French trenches. And I think the most horrific thing about all that was not only is chlorine gas just like a nerve gas where it really irritates you, but the worst part was it burns your throat. And so soldiers tried to drink water to stop the burning sensation. But what would happen is the CL from the gas would mix with the water and it'd basically be like you're drinking acid. So anybody who drank water would just absolutely die because they would drink acid. So I, I, I don't know, what did uh, France or Britain develop that was able to like kind of maintain that stalemate or for them to go on the offensive? So I mainly covered artillery and the changes in guns and howitzers through World War I. So there was kind of two main types of artillery. There was light and heavy, both guns and howitzers. So the more mobile artillery were the light field guns and the light field howitzers. Those weighed about a ton each. And the heavier heavy field guns and heavy field howitzers, usually mobilized by cavalry. The purpose of the artillery on Britain's side was kind of to support the infantry and using the artillery to break down German defenses so that the infantry was able to push forward without putting as many people at risk. Yeah, the French implemented bounding maneuvers, which was basically just machine gun fire out of the trenches as like suppressing fire and just launching a bunch of soldiers up onto no man's land and across to keep shooting and trying to get as close to the the German trenches as possible and then throwing grenades and using their bayonets. The French loved bayonets during World War I. Not sure why, because machine gun fire was so much more effective than getting really up close past the machine gun fire, which took a lot of, you know, sacrificial lambs of the French, (laughs) so to speak, because it was just really easy for the Germans to just rail them down with machine gun fire. But that's kind of what they used, and then they realized, oh, this isn't as effective. Going back to chemical warfare, the the French were the first to actually use chemical warfare, but they used tear gas. This was like early in the war, they used tear gas, and then the Germans were like, no, let's make it more aggressive, and they used poison gas instead. I think by the end of the war, Germany had released like 68,000 tons of poison gas, and the French released 35,000 tons. But what was interesting was knowing the wind direction and weather really helped with planning when to release gas. And there were times where the wind would change in the middle of releasing the gas and all the gas would come back on your own troops, which is kind of terrifying. But, you know, to to combat that, they introduced gas masks, which were like the most valuable piece of protection that the troops owned at the time. Absolutely. I know um, later in the war, due to gas masks, Germany invented mustard gas, which people would put on the gas masks to protect their lungs. But the problem with mustard gas is it also irritates and burns the skin. And so it gets stuck in the uniforms and it absolutely just destroy their feet, arms, limbs. And it, even if you had a gas mask, it's still being in mustard gas for too long would blind you or like incapacitate you. But kind of going back to that idea of, you were talking about how bayonets were ineffective. Yeah. It, it was kind of crazy to think about how war before this, like there had been such a rapid development in technology This hadn't happened before in human history where there had been such a long period without war and there was no sense of what warfare is going to work in this modern age. And one of the coolest things that I researched was, you know, the new domain of the sky. The Wright brothers had made the first flying plane in 1903 and almost 10 years later we have armored fuel powered planes with machine guns on them trying to dominate the skies. And one of the things that made Germany so dominant was at first no one knew what to do with airplanes. They were primarily recon and a lot of these major nations kind of had this like pact of, hey, we'll just use aircraft for recon. But the Italians were the first ones to break that by getting grenades and dropping them out of planes. So Germany kind of took with this and was like, hmm, what can we do to make our aircraft actually like efficient in war? And all the nations were like using small arms, trying to shoot each other down with pistols or rifles in these planes. They kind of came to a consensus. The best way to shoot down an aircraft is with a machine gun. So they all like tried to mount machine guns onto their planes and no nation could successfully do it because when you try to shoot the machine gun out the front of your plane, it would shoot your propeller off. And it was causing a lot of like pilots to actually die because they'd shoot their propellers out and then they'd crash. So what Germany developed was this mechanism for timing it where it had a timer between the propeller spinning and when the round would get fired off so they could shoot through the propeller without shooting it off. And because of that, the Germans were able to make a plane with the first forward shooting machine gun, which dominated the skies from 1915 to 1916 until eventually a pilot with that plane accidentally landed in a British airbase. And the British were able to figure out how to uh, 
engineer the same process. And at that point, kind of that plane had been outclassed. Yeah, it's crazy things to see in the sky. But, you know, we've talked a lot about the Western Front, but one thing that people don't understand is the Eastern Front was not the same animal that the Western Front was. The Western Front was very stalemate, you know, major battles that would cost hundreds of thousands of lives would maybe make a couple of miles at best. But the Eastern Front was really open, you know, lightning warfare type conflict. I know, uh, Patrick, you did Russia. Yeah, uh, Russia had a whole different beast on the Eastern Front. They didn't have all these innovations that... um, these Western countries had, they had machine guns that constantly jammed, installed. They had to think of kind of unique ways to get around these issues. Kind of like a revolutionary war general, General Alexei Brusilov, kind of showed his insight pretty early on. He graduated top of the class at the Officer Cavalry School in St. Petersburg, Russia. And he was also the head of the school. But he was the first person probably in the world to deem cavalry outdated and just wouldn't work in war, despite being the head of that school in Russia. And he had three main tactics that he employed. The first one was hurricane bombardment, instead of sustained artillery that they kind of used on the Western Front. He would use it all in the span of a couple days, whereas these Western countries would just consistently shell these trenches over the course of weeks and months. He would use everything he had on one point really quick, and then he would send basically all his troops into that one spot which is one of the reasons Russia racked up so many bodies during this war was he had this ready reserve strategy where he would have his front line and he would have his reserves immediately behind that front line. So whenever there was a breach in enemy defenses, they could immediately just storm right through that and overwhelm all the enemies behind that line. It was super effective. He was able to really overpower Austria. He basically took Austria out of the war. They had to rely on Germany for basically the rest of the war. But that came at a huge cost to Germany. They lost in this one battle on a southwestern front when they were invading Austria. They uh, Their casualties ranged up to over a million, and Austria lost a little under a million, and Germany lost a little under half a million. In one battle? Well, one offensive spanning the course of a, maybe a summer. It was pretty close to the end of the war, and it was one of the most deadly battles. But his, uh, his tactics kind of went unseen by other Russian generals. It wasn't until later on, World War II, where uh, Stalin had the strategy of Soviet deep battle, which was basically the same thing. And Germany also saw that and created these stormtroopers and various infiltration tactics into their Blitzkrieg plan where they would just power through and just obliterate enemy defenses. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a a ton of these offensives and battles cost millions of lives. I know the Somme was over a million plus, and it's just how technology had outpaced strategy. You know, machine guns, artillery were just able to mow people down. No command had had a better strategy at the time. But, you know, one thing that I know plagued Russia during World War I was its supply lines and communications and kind of stuff like that. So can you talk about that and just how, you know, Russia was able to, what they were able to do or what they weren't able to do because of their supply lines? Well, Russia's supply lines ended up kind of screwing them over for the rest of the war because Brusilov's tactics, while they were effective, they weren't able to sustain that for very long. So in this offensive here, they were able to break through Austrian defenses. And once they did that, they really didn't have anything left. They were all out of artillery shells. They were running low on ammo. And they basically would just fight until they lost their last man. But by the time that happened, they were able to have French or British troops there to kind of help save them. But they can't, like, revive all those troops that they lost. So in the end, that's why Russia ended up having to pull out of this war, was because they were just losing so many people. Everything they had, hit it at that one spot, and then send your guys to that one spot. He actually uh, was credited with kind of like the first special operations teams, where he would have these special units designed, so they would do these hurricane bombardments on these certain spots and then send like a special team in to kind of scout it out and maybe take out some of the stuff that's left and then he would send in his front lines with his reserves right behind them to kind of overpower anything they had left there. Absolutely you know just the nationalism and the patriotism of these nations you know everyone quit their jobs to join in the war and Germany thought it was going to be really quick and another part of this nationalist idea that I kind of liked was propaganda. You know, one of the biggest German pieces of propaganda was the Red Baron. Germany had dominated the skies, and this pilot, Victor von Richthofen, 
he had confirmed over 80 kills in the sky, which is insane by modern day standards. But like to be, you know, one of the pioneers of piloting and be able to shoot down 80 aircraft, that's absurd. He used revolutionary tactics of the time. Is there any other propaganda that your guys' nations use to boost morale or like keep them in the war effort? Or maybe that harmed them? Yeah, um, Germany used it against the United States, actually. When the United States came to the war, they wanted something that they could really just bust through the trenches with. Um, General John Pershing, he wanted to put artillery into the hands of his troops. So they're using shotguns. And um, the Germans' response to that was they hated the shotguns because they would just take out their guys. But they said that the U.S. had to use shotguns because they were subpar riflemen and they, they couldn't use rifles. And then they also compared them to Native Americans in uh, America saying that that's a weapon for savages and only like savages use them and they were comparing them to the Native Americans. The Native Americans didn't like that. American civilians and troops didn't like being compared to them so it was kind of just like a double whammy there. Yeah, in France, it's really interesting. So like at the Battle of Verdun, it's just a really long, drawn out battle trying to hold this last fort and not letting Germany get any more land. And there's a famous, famous quote, they shall not pass, talking about how Germany, they will not go through, they will not give in, they will not take over Verdun. And as people may be aware in social and American culture and international culture, I guess, J.R.R. Tolkien fought in World War One. And so in Lord of the Rings and in the live action make of the book, Gandalf the Grey has a famous quote, you shall not pass, you cannot pass. And that was taken from this famous French phrase, they shall not pass, which was plastered all over posters, all over France as just a big hurrah, nationalistic motivator to keep fighting. Absolutely. Speaking of they shall not pass, there were some things that the Allies were working on to help pass these lines that the Germans had set up. Uh, Alice, what was one of the things that like Britain had developed to try to get through the German lines? Yeah, so the main changes in artillery technology that helped change its usefulness were the integrated recoil system for the artillery. So instead of recoiling and the weapon moving back really far, it was a part of the carriage, so it was able to remain stationary while firing, and this enabled them to implement gun shields onto the howitzers and onto the field guns so that the gunners were protected from enemy fire while they were operating the weapons. This made a huge difference in their ability to operate with artillery because it wasn't quite as risky. Prior to World War I, the primary method of fire was direct fire, where you just shot your gun straight at the target. But into World War I, this kind of changed where they were using indirect fire, where you fire at a proxy target that made it possible to hit something that's, for example, on the other side of a hill. So one example of a battle that really showcases the difference between direct and indirect fire is the Battle of Le Coteau. So in this battle, there was two British divisions that were defending a ridge, one of which was using direct fire and the other one was using indirect fire. So the division using direct fire had their guns forward and among their infantry. And in this division, 35% of their guns were lost, but they also were able to effectively target the Germans, while the other division that was using indirect fire with their guns hidden behind a ridge, um, none of their guns were lost to the German fire, but they were also less effective at aiming and they had some communication challenges in terms of communicating with the other side of the ridge. But this proved to be the better strategy because they weren't losing as many infantry as they were with direct fire, which had worked in previous wars, but with the quick firing gun was no longer quite as effective. Another technology that they developed during World War I was tanks. They were able to crush barbed wire in protecting the trenches with the tanks, which helped make bombardments a lot shorter and more feasible. Yeah, so Britain had developed the tank, and, you know, that was kind of like a secret piece of tech that they had been working on. That was their idea to, hey, this tank is going to breach the trench. Germany kind of took a completely different approach to trench raiding. They kind of learned from the Eastern Front and the Russian general about targeting that specific area and then rushing it, and they developed the stormtroopers. So basically, everyone had been fighting in the war, farmers, dads, everyone. But the Germans kind of took the best of the best that they had, and they kind of took this Russian strategy of heavy bombardment and then 
rush it as quick as you can. And they developed these storm battalions, which consisted of two stormtrooper companies, a machine gun company, a trench mortar team, a forward battery, an infantry gun battalion, and then a flame projector platoon. And basically what they did was they specialized these infantry and they'd have them go out in the middle of the night, cut the barbed wire, sneak up real close, and then they'd have the gun battery and the artillery bombard a special spot. And these guys were danger close. And as soon as the artillery would quit, as the allies, before they could have time to recover, these stormtroopers would jump into the trenches with these new weapons like submachine guns. The Germans developed the MP-18, which was much better suited for these trench engagements instead of the long rifles that they had at the time. They had a ton of grenades, flamethrowers, which was huge for the Germans because it was extremely demoralizing for the Allies, watching your buddies get burned to death. And no one had implemented flamethrowers like the Germans had at the time. Other nations started to pick it up. Germany dominated the sky, and then other nations were able to catch up, so no one had control over the sky. Artillery, it's kind of hard to outclass people with artillery because you can only do so much. But one thing that Germany really focused on was this advanced and specialized infantry and it was completely tactics that they had taken from the Russians if you would like to speak to that a little bit more yeah going off on a little bit what I said earlier this Russian offensive into Austria completely crippled Austria and they were completely dependent on Germany for the rest of the war but to the credit of Germany they're the most creative probably country out of the whole war and they can turn any bad situation into a good one and they saw these tactics, and they, they saw that these Russian generals and politicians weren't really picking up on them, and they just took them and they made them better. And while uh, these tactics caused Russia to get out of the war, they allowed Germany to stay in the war for much, much longer. Yeah, I think Germany had over 600 offensive operations via flamethrower. I know the French tried to develop their own flamethrowers um, in response to that, but they, they weren't as effective, and, and Germany was just so far ahead. It was... France's entire war is just kind of just trying to play catch up to Germany with all their their advances with artillery and machine guns and with the French. The Germans had so much more reliable weapons and artillery. The French had the Saint Etienne machine gun, but that was way too delicate, way too complex for use in trench warfare. So they utilized the 75 millimeter, the Soissons cans, if you speak French, <laughs> um, machine gun. But that, while it did have excellent range and stuff, it was a lot more flat trajectory, so it was harder to use when you were down inside a trench. And so the Germans were just, just light years ahead. Artillery-wise, it was just hard to play catch-up. Speaking of ideas that Germany had actually taken from France, a lot of these junior officers in France had kind of wrote up to high command, hey, uh, it's good to have high command, but we need operations to be more decentralized where you tell us what to do and then we run the operations. And French high command didn't really take this with any merit and they kind of disregarded it. But Germans kind of took this and they said, all right, we're taking the strategy used by the Russians and we're going to use these decentralized command where high command will give us an order, but these junior officers who are extremely experienced will be able to run the operations themselves because these are the guys who are in the trenches fighting and kind of know how the enemy is going to react and stuff like that. And that's another reason that the stormtroopers were so efficient. It's because at the time, all nations had been using high commands and like any offensive was passed down from high command and then the officer would do what high command would wanted. Germany, on the other hand, had high command say, hey, this needs to get done. You figure out how to do it. It was kind of the start to the modern day military of where junior officers are given a little bit more autonomy to decide on how they wanted to do stuff. And it kind of speaks to the adaptability that Germany had. And I know that one area that France wasn't super adaptable was intelligence. Yeah, intelligence wise, they, they kind of fell short. While they were playing catch up, really trying to make progress with like weapon systems, trying to get their planes to be as effective as Germany's. I think their highest ace score they had, while well, you said yours had 80 plus kills or something, I think France had 43 was their highest, which is still up there, but it's far behind what Germany could do. But intelligence-wise, it was such an oxymoron. Developments and weapon systems were just going, 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 trying to get better and better. And the French were still using carrier pigeons to deliver messages. They kind of had telephone systems, but they were sparse and they didn't have enough time to set them up because they just weren't really prepared for such a long, drawn-out stalemate of trench warfare. And they used observation balloons, which Germany used them as well. Those were giant balloons to scout the skies, but even getting the information from the observation balloons which were looking for trench line locations and movement of the enemy. Getting that information back to the unit took forever. And so France France was so far behind intelligence-wise, which 
caused Verdun to get overrun by Germans because it was a complete failure on the intelligence community, how they didn't foresee all of those troops coming to invade them. So I don't know if Aiden, you want to talk more about intelligence on the German side, but on the French side, it was failing. <laughs> Germany was an absolute war machine at the start of World War I. I can only say the Prussian culture of military excellence had really carried over into World War I. And even though German high command didn't know where the new domains of warfare would be, just the sense of adaptability and intelligence was pretty decent. But the Allies made intelligence actually really hard because they would have, as you were talking about earlier, fake trenches. And they also did like blow up artillery cannons and stuff that were just balloons almost. Yeah, the observation balloons were booby-trapped to explode. <laughs> I don't know the specifics, but they were booby-trapped to explode whenever enemy airplanes got near enough to try to shoot them down because they were such a big target because this giant balloon in the sky could see everything, could see across no man's land. The troops in the trenches couldn't. So they were a big target, but they were also wired to explode if need be. So, Do you have anything to the British intelligence? Yeah, I was just going to say that communication was definitely a challenge for every nation throughout World War I, and that that didn't really change until portable radios became more practical to use, which wasn't until the 1930s. So World War I was definitely a time when communication was significantly behind where other technology in terms of weaponry was. Fun fact, the carrier pigeon or the messenger pigeon went extinct after World War I because so many of them were shot down and used during the war. So crazy to think just human nature, we will make an animal go extinct to win a war. Once again, 1903, the first plane was made. 1915, we have machine guns, they're mechanized, dog fighting thousands of feet above the ground. It's just crazy to think how fast war drives the technological pace of humanity. Any other saved rounds or final thoughts? One thing I uh, wanted to talk about was uh, the American use of the shotgun in the trenches. And it was pretty funny that Germany uh, was able to mount a machine gun on a plane. They used gas. They used flamethrowers. But when America started using a shotgun, they had Switzerland make a request to the United States on their behalf, questioning the ethics of a combat use shotgun, to which the United States said, we don't care. When America came into the war, the... Uh, Trench warfare was pretty stagnant, and General John Pershing wanted like artillery in the hands of men. And they didn't really they didn't know what to do. But when they kind of discovered that you could put a shotgun in war, that kind of changed everything. So they settled on the Winchester Model 1897, and that thing was just built for the trenches. The uh, Americans eventually called it the Trench Sweeper because they could just sweep away German troops in these trenches. It was super powerful, 12 gauge which historically 12 gauge meant that with one pound of lead you can make 12 lead balls but for the model that they used in world war one just meant it was super powerful it could blow your limbs off with only a few shots it could blow through a brick wall also dug in defenses german defenses in these trenches and the barrel length is also pretty short it's only 18 inches so it was ideal for quickly maneuvering through these trenches you were able to reload it insanely fast you could basically shoot and reload at the same time because you'd pull the trigger down, pump the shotgun, let go of the trigger, and it would shoot, and you just keep doing that. So you could essentially reload and shoot at the same time. And while you could only have six shells in the shotgun at a time, you could have bandoliers that would hold 56 shells. Men would go with at least two bandoliers of shells on there, and they would just wreak havoc in these trenches. And then, like I said earlier, the only time in the history of the world the ethics of a combat shotgun has been questioned. And the U.S. said, we don't care. You guys use flamethrowers and serrated bayonets. So if you guys keep using those, we're going to keep using the shotgun. Germany made a statement like, U.S. aren't good riflemen. They can't shoot rifles. That's why they need to use the shotgun. Again, the U.S. was like, we don't care. But they didn't want to get a bad look. So the Secretary of the State at the time, Robert Lansing, he censored all pictures of Americans with shotguns and all statistics of Americans with shotguns. So any evidence you want to find with an American shotgun is almost purely anecdotal. You can't find pictures, you can't find statistics, because they had all that censored so the Germans couldn't use it and say that Americans were savages and all this other stuff. And France and Britain also had double-barreled shotguns, but they were never able to develop a pump-action reload or have powerful ammunition that would make it worth their time 
to arm their men with it. So Americans were the only ones with a shotgun. It's crazy to think that a nation that was gassing soldiers and flamethrowers and stuff would get so upset over pump-action shotgun. Yeah, and I think, rightly so, trench warfare really dominates our collective cultural memory of World War One. Like, that's what you think of when you think of World War One. And something that's not discussed nearly as often um, is the artillery technology, because trench warfare is just so, so ingrained in the story of World War One. But... More than 50% of battle wounds on the Western Front were caused by artillery. And looking at both empirical evidence, like doctors' clinical data and the wounding patterns of soldiers, and also anecdotal evidence, like the memories and diaries and the letters written by soldiers, just show the additional impact that artillery had on battlefields in World War I, to the point that a new medical diagnosis was even created with shell shock and which was the impacts that bombardments from artillery had on soldiers in World War One. Not even on in addition to all artillery on trench warfare, the fighting in France was on French land. And I have statistics here, almost 1,700 villages in France were just 100% destroyed by the Germans. Over 700 were 75% destroyed, and 1,600 were 50% destroyed. So there's a lot of, in addition to just all the soldiers dying and military who signed up for war dying, there's a lot of civilian and French land that got in the way of Germans' plan. And to think that this war, they said, would only last a couple of months. Yeah, Kaiser Wilhelm thought it was going to last 45 days. <laughs> Lasted four years. <laughs> Alrighty then, I think that's it for today. Thank you for signing in, and the Squadcast is out. Peace. This has been a production of the History Department at the U.S. Naval Academy, located in Annapolis, Maryland. If you enjoy our programs, please let us know, as we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at USNA History. And our email is historyproductions-group at usna.edu. For more information about the History Department at the Naval Academy, please visit usna.edu history.